College and the director of their police seminar program office in Washington, D.C. And I'd like to say a special welcome to our virtual uh, participants this afternoon. Uh, I understand we have about 14 or 15 uh, of you attending virtually. That's, that's, that's great. I, I've been doing the uh, conference so far totally virtually, and, the, and that's a pretty good number. The numbers, just so you know, have been about at least five and often as many as 15 to 20 uh, attending virtually. So that, that's very good. And the fact that we have this kind of a turnout, 15.30 on a beautiful Friday afternoon at the end of a long conference, is good sign. Uh, I want to take my hat off to uh, Dr. Lumsford and to uh, uh, Commander Stan Fisher and all the staff here at the Academy who have done a marvelous job of pulling this all together. It's, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to interact with people. Nothing quite like it. But to be able to do it virtually and to see participation like one I saw this morning coming in from uh, Plymouth, England, <laughs> it was a thousand players about. It extends our possibilities of being able to reach people who are interested in naval history. And I, so I, I'm really delighted that the Academy has made that effort to do that for us. Uh, this afternoon, I think we have a, a, a fascinating set of panels and papers to consider. Uh, I thought all three of the papers, and I read them, were, were, were fascinating and, and, and uh, quite scholarly uh, in, the, in their approach to the problem of how does Britain deal with maritime affairs in the era after the First World War. When Britain is clearly uh, in a declining position of relative power, and how does, how does she uh, manage her naval affairs? Yeah, a lot to be learned from that, and I think each of the panelists in their own way have, have addressed the various aspects of that problem in fascinating ways. Uh, we have uh, for you uh, Dr. Chuck Steele here to my immediate right uh, from the Air Force Academy, and it, it's worth noting that of the four of us here, uh, are still the real speakers, the, including our commentator, and these three gentlemen have done all the work in preparing panels, that the two of the four come from the Air Force Academy. I cannot imagine what a difficult job it is to teach naval history at the Air Force Academy, uh, but if you look at their resumes, you know that they are incredibly well to do that. Thanks, and I think it's made a part to what King's College London has done for them in their early academic careers. In any event, uh, Dr. Steele uh, is the chair of, of the Naval History portion of, of the Naval Academy's program in history, also teaches um, military thought and teaches World War I uh, and, and general military history, I believe, as, as well. And his paper this afternoon will deal with a, a fascinating character, is David Beatty, uh, uh, played a key role, obviously, in the role of the Royal Navy in the post-World War era. And I think Dr. Steele will offer us some interesting insights on a very controversial figure. I look, I look forward to, to that. Uh, the, the second paper uh, will deal uh, also with uh, an interesting facet of, I think, of, of British naval history. It's be done by Dr. Joe Moretz. Uh, Joe is a graduate of the Naval War College and also did an MA and PhD at King's College London. I, and they elected to say, Dr. Steele also did a master's degree at King's College London and his doctorate at West Virginia University. But anyway, Joe did both his MA and his PhD there at, at uh, King's College London and has written three books. He's an independent scholar, currently serving on faculty member as adjunct faculty here at the Naval Academy. Three books and six chapters in other books, another book forthcoming, and demonstrates some real scholarship. And he's going to look at the Washington Arms Conference. And the impact that had on the Royal Navy, uh, how they operated for the years after that. Now, those of us who are navalists, naval historians, often overlook the vital importance of the merchant marine. Uh, even as late as the Persian Gulf War, navalists were proud of telling you that about 85% of the stuff that goes to war goes by sea. And it does. And, uh, Dr. Sal, uh, help me with the pronunciation of the last Pagliano. name. That now uh, has incredibly good background. Talk to us about that. He has served as a merchant mariner, uh, worked for the Military Sea Lift Command, and decided that he wanted to study naval and maritime history. So he started out at East Carolina University for his master's degree, and then a doctorate at the University of Alabama in history. 
uh, that has a couple of really thoughtful articles and books on the topic. And he will address the, the challenge of the American merchant marine and the British, the English merchant marine in the years after the Washington Arms Conference. We tend to think of, of naval competitions as being totally in the, in the naval domain, but the maritime domain is equally important. With that said, enough for me, and I'll turn the podium over to uh, Dr. Chuck Steele. Thank you very much. Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, I'm going to talk about David Beatty, but uh, I want to talk about him in a, in a certain context. I want to talk about him as sort of the, the, the product of the Royal Navy's cultivation of a particular ethos. Uh, this is, you know, Beatty, to, to have a paper that's, that's critical of Beatty is probably not entirely surprising. Uh, he's one of the more controversial figures in, in naval history uh, from the time of the Battle of Jutland moving forward. You know, people sort of divided into the two camps, you know, Jellicoe and, and, and Beatty. Uh, they certainly had their followers. Beatty, I think, was, which was, <clears throat> Beatty was much better positioned uh, to preserve or, or promote uh, a reputation uh, that was that was favorable, uh, as he wound up being uh, the, the first sea lord, uh, sort of the, the, the British version of the chief of naval operations by today's standards, uh, for about eight years. And so if you think about all the officers who were beholding to Beatty or who had served with Beatty, uh, he was sort of insulated from a lot of criticism. Uh, and as, I, as I'll talk about in, in the course of my presentation, uh, I think one of the, the, the greatest sources of insulation from criticism uh, was the degree to which he was associated with Winston Churchill. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see, carry up this going the right way. Yeah, so uh, of course I work for the United States government uh, and, and as Chuck noted, uh, <clears throat> at the Air Force Academy, not that the Air Force or the Air Force Academy would have an opinion on naval history. Uh, all the same though, uh, I, I, I am obligated to tell you all that uh, these are my views and not those of the Air Force, the Air Force Academy, or the Department of Defense. Uh, for those of you who are saying, why is William S. Sims up there if it's you know, the Guild Hall lecture, or, or not lecture, but speech where uh, he committed the United States, although he had no authority to commit the United States, to the defense of Britain. I'm um, just trying to avoid that. So, <laughs> Not that anybody's going to take anything that I say so seriously as to, I'll get a phone call from, from the president. Not, not likely. Whoops. Shoot. Big fat fingers. So, in order to get to where I'm going today, I uh, will talk about why the, the preservation and the crea creation of ethos within the Royal Navy uh, leads to this rather unfortunate episode in history, which is David Beatty's time as a flag officer. So, briefly, to get there, I want to talk about the creation or the cultivation of ethos that is, you know, a, a spirit that's sort of you know, an animating spirit for, for the organization. Uh, after that, I want to talk about the situation that Beatty actually found himself in and why he was, in a sense, an inappropriate figure uh, to be occupying this position of responsibility. Uh, and then I'll probably, seeing as how time will be running short, I have no doubt um, I'll, I'll run into, because as I understand it, there's a discrepancy between the book uh, and, and what was online. So I think we're supposed to be finished here uh, by, by five o'clock. So anyway, uh, try and get to this uh, business about avoiding accountability. And, there we go. So the first thing, you know, real quick, talking about uh, the development of, of a, a certain spirit, the thing that animates the Royal Navy. I mean, go back to the earliest of times, and, and the first heroes of, of the Navy, you know, men such as, as Drake, uh, who were you know over overly glorified privateers, perhaps, but, but men who were motivated by profit, uh, and as such were, were extremely aggressive. Uh, and, and sort of set a standard by which, you know, other officers would be judged in the future. But uh, the, the hallmark of this was, was audacity. And a, another great case in point uh, would be Baron Anson, George Anson, the fellow in the middle, uh, who I think gets, you know, neglected, uh, you know, far, far too much. Uh, mm -hmm. I think if, at a service academy, you could probably find uh, all sorts of, of cadets or midshipmen who, who have at least heard of Frederick the Great, uh, but it's, you know, it's an interesting thing that, you know, at the end of the Seven Years' War, you know, certainly Prussia does not emerge as a world power, but Britain does. Uh, and, and nobody could tell you about George Anson and, and how he had positioned the Royal Navy to be uh, more or less the dominant fighting force uh, 
on, on the seas, which allows for Britain's creation of an empire. But, but Anson Drake is the first Englishman to uh, circumnavigate the globe. Uh, Anson is, is the second in, in his expedition against the, the Spanish. And if, you, if you're familiar with that story, or, or if you're not, um, it, it's about 90% disaster uh, up until the very end. Uh, and, and in the end, you know, Anson, who had left England with a, a, a small fleet or a, a, a decent sized squadron to, to travel from, you know, from England into the Pacific uh, to raid against the Spanish, uh, by the time you know, he accomplishes his mission, He's down to a single ship uh, and an HMS Centurion, but he manages to catch the, the, the main treasure ship that transits the Pacific to collect all the money for, for Spain and comes back. And it's, it's worth more than the expedition by far. Uh, it makes a fortune for, for Anson. And you know, if you look at all the things that had been lost in, in the process of staging this operation, you, know, you think this is a disaster, but because the, the end result is, is successful, you know, monetarily, that, that Anson is going to become uh, quite a hero who will add to his fortune over time. Apparently, he was a, a very talented gambler, uh, but also later in his career, he scored some other successes against the French, uh, and so was constantly increasing his own wealth. Because if you're if you're not familiar with the British, uh, they maintain a system of of you know prizes. That if you more or less if you captured it and it was of value you got to, to share in that with the crown considerably. Uh, and so he, he made out uh, quite well. The other fellow, of course, is, is Admiral Bing, John Bing. Uh, and and you know, some of you guys might have heard Ryan Mewitt's uh, talk yesterday, talking about court martials and, and trying to uh, sort of quantify uh, the effects of, of, of these things. Um, and saying that really, maybe it was overstated, but. Where I don't think it's overstated is in the establishment of ethos or in the feeding of ethos. Uh, the, the quote is from Voltaire, uh, but in, it's from Candide, but in this country it is considered a good thing to kill an admiral from time to time for the encouragement of the others. Um, and I think that kind of gets right to the heart of, of, of ethos. That you, you put out the incentive to make people bold and audacious so that there's the carrot, uh, but you also have the stick, which is if you do not do your utmost, uh, that, that possibly you know you, you could you could find yourself facing a firing squad even if you're an admiral, um, because you know as as time goes on of course they have a far greater hero than the rest and and that of course is, is Horatio Nelson I just love this image I think I I got it off the internet I think it traced about it was like something in the, the Daily Telegraph but I remember when, when when Britons dream or at least when naval historians in Britain dream this is probably what they imagine as Nelson forever. But of course, nobody, nobody in history, uh, I think, you know, at least not in, in, in the English-speaking world, uh, sets a better example for audacity than, than Horatio Nelson, uh, beloved to this day. I'm sure John Redgard down in, in, in the 1805 Club, I think they're sponsoring a, uh, the 1805 Club, you know, sponsoring a session here uh, at the Academy. Nelson lives, folks. Um, but anyway, this is the standard, you know, to which English naval officers aspire or should aspire. Um, and so this brings me to Beatty. Beatty is, is, is an interesting character because at the time that, that, you know, when he becomes an admiral, he's probably as well known a figure in the Royal Navy uh, as there is. He, he has an outstanding uh, record, especially when it comes to audacity or, or when it comes to physical courage. The problem is that, that Beatty's reputation is gained not at sea, uh, but really from, from two events uh, that have more to do with land campaigns. Uh, the first one is is during the relief expedition. Uh, the you know, or <laughs> Wolseley's uh, relief expedition for Gordon. Uh, Beatty was was second in command. Uh, the gunboat flotilla is going down uh, to, in support of of the expedition. Uh, Colville, the officer who's in charge, is wounded. Beatty takes charge. Beatty's going to do some, some remarkable things, including extricating a shell from a ship with his bare hands, throwing it overboard. But in the end, Beatty wins the DSO. Uh, he's recognized for his bravery and winds up being promoted to, to, to commander basically in half the time of any of his, his, his associates from, from, you know, from his commissioning group. The, the second image is, is from the Boxer Rebellion. Beatty follows Colville out to the Asia station 
Uh, Colville is the commanding officer of HMS Barfleur. Uh, Beatty is going to take a contingent of sailors from Barfleur uh, and engage in, in land action again. Uh, he's going to be wounded, uh, shot in the hand and, and the arm, uh, and, and again distinguishes himself. And, and Beatty, for this, is going to be promoted to captain. And so, you know, here, here's a guy who, you know, two events, uh, you know, in, the, in, in less than 10 years' time, who is propelled into the limelight and is seen as embodying you know, sort of the, 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 you know, the qualities that, that the Royal Navy treasures the most. Uh, the problem with this is none of this involves service at sea. None of this actually involves competence in, in seamanship or, you know, navigation, any of the things that we would associate with it. Uh, and, and so, you know, the thing, again, that's, you know, this prize, that's part of this ethos is, is you know, are you aggressive? And, and Beatty certainly seems to be that, but at the expense of he hasn't really developed uh, the, the skills or the things that we would normally associate with somebody reaching the rank of, of captain uh, and having a great deal of time at, at sea. Um, and this brings us to another thing, which uh, something, another thing I want to Ch Churchill's other big mistake as, as First Lord of the Admiralty. You know, when we talk about Churchill as First Lord of the Admiralty, I think the first thing everybody thinks about is Gallipoli. And, uh, you know, this was Churchill's big blunder. It, it haunted him uh, for the rest of, of, of his life. But uh, Churchill makes a mistake that I think is even bigger, uh, and that's his championing David Beatty. Uh, Beatty, in the time between the Boxer Rebellion and World War I, uh, Beatty is going to marry Ethel Tree. Once she gets divorced, it's about 10 days after her divorce, uh, he marries her. Uh, she was the heir to the Marshall Fields fortune, Marshall Fields in, in Chicago. And so Beatty, at a stroke, you know, he, he, got, he got to marry the woman he loved, although not entirely faithful or not faithful for, for much time after that. Uh, and one would say neither was she. But nonetheless, uh, you know, he marries the woman that he loves. Uh, he comes into a fortune, and that frees him from, you know, the pains of trying to derive his living simply from doing what the Navy wants him to do. Uh, and a, a, a big case in point being that Beatty is going to be made rare. In fact, he's going to be the, the, the youngest admiral since, you know, 1805, and I believe it was Nelson was, was you know, to that point, the youngest man appointed admiral. So, so Beatty is, is following in, in Nelson's footsteps, rapid promotion for bravery, you know, a questionable love affair, all this good stuff. He looks, he looks so much like Nelson, except of course that his his success isn't really founded on on serving at sea. Uh, he gets the opportunity once he's made admiral. Uh, they want to assign him to be the second in command of the Atlantic Fleet, which would have put him beneath John Jellicoe, and he would have had the opportunity to associate with Jellicoe, to work with Jellicoe, to understand Jellicoe. And Beatty says no. Uh, Beatty has enough. Uh, you know, enough going for him that he figures he can refuse the Navy. Now, most people, you would probably think this is the end of your career, um, but for Vady, that's, that's, that's not going to be the case, uh, because Winston Churchill comes along uh, about a year after this, and Winston Churchill is going to uh, put Beatty uh, in the position as his naval secretary. And I, I have a quote that I think kind of sums up this. Uh, this is Churchill talking about Beatty. Uh, it became increasingly clear to me that Beatty viewed, or that he viewed questions of naval strategy and tactics in a different light from the average naval officer. He approached them as it seemed to me much more as a soldier would. His war experiences on land illuminated the fact that he had acquired in his naval training. He was no mere instrumentalist. That's what's missing down here. Uh, in other words, you know, it didn't matter so much to Churchill that this man understands the technical or technological demands of his profession. You know, this is a decisive man. This is a guy. Who, like Church, you know, Churchill had gone to Sandhurst, had been a soldier, distinguished himself, gained his fame that way. Here's a guy that I can relate to. The, the, the problem with that is that this is an age of, of rapidly evolving technologies. Here you see Mikasa, uh, Admiral Togo's flagship at the Battle of Tsushima, which in 1905 is, is state-of-the-art technology. Um, you move forward from that, you know, 11 years, and you're looking at HMS War Spite. Uh, which actually is, is under Beatty's command uh, at, at the Battle of Jutland because there's a swap out between one of the battle cruiser squadrons um, and, and, and the battle squadron that has uh, the Queen Elizabeth class battleships in it. Um, and so, you know, when you look at this thing in terms of displacement, I mean, if we just, you know, try to make this quick, 
Um, obviously, a, a much faster ship uh, in terms of you know with its with its turbine engines and and uh, much greater displacement, much greater firepower. Mikasa had four 12-inch guns. Uh, if you look at, at Warspite, uh, it, you know, eight 15-inch guns. Uh, I think Mikasa steamed somewhere around 16, 16 to 18 knots, uh, and I believe Warspite was somewhere up around 24, uh, 24, 24 and a half knots. But a much bigger, better ship. But this is this is what has happened in this short span of time. So I think you know to say you know uh, you know he wasn't a mere instrumentalist is a rather unfortunate uh, appraisal because the technology is changing uh, and having somebody who would be a bit more astute than Beatty probably would have served the Royal Navy uh, far better than, than what had happened. Uh, the other thing that I want to get to is, is Beatty had opportunities to learn and, and Beatty goes from being the Naval Secretary to when the Battle Cruiser Squadron, which eventually becomes the Battle Cruiser Fleet, uh, when command is, is, is vacant, Churchill will appoint Beatty to be the commander of the battle cruiser squad. So in a sense, you know, everything that happens to, to Beatty, you could point back and say that it was Winston Churchill who had made this possible. Uh, and, and if you read through Churchill's accounts of World War I, you know, he is not very critical of Beatty. In fact, he looks for opportunities, you know, to throw quotes in and other things, you know, from other people, or at least attributed to other people that, that, that glorify uh, Beatty and his accomplishments. Now, it's been argued, I, there was a, a professor at the New War College a few years back, I remember reading this article and kind of, you know, I found myself being somewhat miffed as I read this thing, where it talked about the, the Royal Navy had forgotten, uh, you know, in the time from, from, from Trafalgar to Jutland, the Royal Navy had forgotten how to fight battles. I said that's an absolutely horrific thing to say because it really misses the point. The point is, if we look at this illegal land fight in, in 1914, Beatty's present with his battle cruisers. Cornell in the Falklands, Beatty is not present, but at the Falklands, two of his battle cruisers are. Uh, Beatty is present at Dogger Bank, and then of course Beatty is present in a very large way at, at, at Jutland. They had experience in battle. The Royal Navy had experience. They had fought what we would consider to be major naval engagements. I think the problem is that, that they were very poor students of their own experience. At Heligoland Bank, they have reason to, to just you know revel in, in, in their success. Uh, but but starting off there, at the Falklands, even though the battle cruisers are involved and they do tremendous service, uh, they had about a six percent hit rate. Uh, they they weren't very accurate, but you know when their shots hit, uh, they did tremendous damage. Dogger Bank, um, I think the the you know the rate of rounds hitting things other than Blucher, which is the only one of, of Hipper's cruisers that gets sunk. Uh, was also abysmal. I think it was somewhere, you know, the other ships, I think it was somewhere closer to like 1%. Um, and so, I mean, they, they had a genuine problem, uh, but very little, if anything, is going to be done to address this. The other thing is at Dogger Bank, the reason that Blucher gets sunk is because bad signals. Uh, Beatty's flagship Lion gets pummeled, and, and his flag lieutenant, Ralph Seymour, is sending messages to concentrate on the rear of the enemy line. And that's to the other officers commanding other ships. That's Blucher. It's the last ship in the line. So everybody winds up pounding Blucher, and the rest of, of Hipper's ships manage to escape. Um, so I said, that's, that's kind of problematic. Following this, um, one of the battle cruiser squadron commanders uh, in his sort of AAR points to the bad signals, saying that, look, the problem was we were following the instructions that we were given by Beatty. Um, the result isn't that Beatty is made to answer for bad orders. Seymour is not made to, to, to answer for bad orders. Seymour will retain his job and will have a similar problem at the Battle of, of Jutland. Uh, Moore, who had commanded that group of battle crews who had the audacity to criticize Beatty, Moore gets fired and he's going to be replaced by a guy named Pat Pakenham, uh, who is a, a you know, a, a maybe you could say a Beatty sycophant. I don't know, but he is, he is definitely... Uh, much kinder and much more adoring of, of Beatty. Um, so actually, I'm kind of running quick here. I, I believe this is Lion uh, at, at Jutland. Uh, this, this brings us to the time after Dogger Bank. And again, I think this is, I think this is, you know, kind of important when we talk about ethos and understanding. Beatty writes a letter to Jellicoe basically saying, Moore isn't the sort of fellow, I never really thought he was the sort of fellow who should be commanding battle cruisers. Uh, 
Jellicoe, I think, is, is developing the opinion that maybe Beatty is a little bit too rash. Uh, in fact, Jellicoe is going to write Beatty a note in March of 1915, uh, which is rather remarkable. Some of you might be aware of the note. Um, but uh, let's see, trying to find, uh, pardon me, let me take so long. Guess I have it. Yeah, I'm starting to write a difficult letter. I should imagine that the Germans will sooner or later try and entrap you by using their battle cruisers as a decoy. They must know that I am where I am, in other words, you know, up in Scapel Flow, and you are where you are off the Firth of Forth, um, and they may well argue that the position is one which lends itself to a trap to bring you into the high seas fleet with the battle cruisers as bait. They know that if they can get you in chase, the odds are that you will be 100 miles away from me, and they can, under such circumstance or such conditions, draw you well down to the legal land bite without my being in effective support. It is quite all right if you keep your speed, of course, but it is the reverse if you have some ships with their speed speed badly reduced in the fight with the battle cruisers or by submarines. In that case, the loss of such ships seems inevitable if you are drawn into the vicinity of the high seas fleet with me still too far off to get you help or to their help so as to extricate before dark. Um, and like I said, it's rather prophetic because that's more or less what's going to happen to Beatty. He's going to be drawn in. Uh, and in that instance, he has, so Beatty's down in the court, Jellicoe's up top, there's Shear and there's Hipper, the commander of, of the, the German battle cruiser. Um, anyway, so, so looking at this, Beatty gets drawn into the very trap that, that Jellicoe has, has foreseen. And even though Beatty has available to him the Queen Elizabeth class battleships with his battle cruisers that are faster than, than those ships, he basically outstrips them. And he has not had any communications with Evan Thomas, the commander of those ships, they haven't worked out any standard operating procedures. There's really a lack of communications. For a guy who'd been likened to, to, to Nelson, he never does the work to develop a band of brothers where everybody is, is on the same page in terms of, of performance or behavior. Uh, and what develops uh, is, is a mess. Very, very quickly, Beatty moves beyond his, his ships. Their guns outrange the Germans, but he moves within range of the German ships, uh, again, with, with problems in targeting. Uh, they leave one of the, the big German battle cruisers, Der Flinger, un, unattended. Uh, and in short order, Beatty's going to lose two battle cruisers. Um, when he sees the high seas fleet coming, he makes a turn to the north to run back to, to Jellicoe, uh, but does not keep Jellicoe properly apprised of what's going on. Uh, if you've read Andrew Gordon's The Rules of the Game, Gordon gives uh, Beatty credit you know, for his stamina and other things to bring the Germans uh, uh, you know, to Jellicoe, but if you look at Jellicoe's position, Beatty does nothing to really keep Jellicoe apprised of, of how the Germans are coming off. Uh, it's rather remarkable how well uh, Jellicoe does in, in stopping the, the, the Germans from making more of, of, of their advantages. Um, in the end, and I'm running really short on time, in the end, we know how, how this turns out. The run to the south is disastrous. That's where Beatty's going to lose his two battle cruisers. Um, and then in the run to the north, if we look down here, you know, twice over, Jellicoe is going to maneuver into such a way that he cuts Shear off, crosses Shear's teeth. Uh, he is going to lose another battle cruiser. Horace Hood, battle cruiser is going to be lost. Hood would have normally been a part of Beatty's squadron, but they were up getting gunnery practice with, with the rest of the fleet. Um, the battle ends more or less, you know, the actions happen throughout the night, but, but Jellicoe does proceed cautiously, uh, worrying that he might lose some of his more expensive ships uh, to things like mines. Uh, and, and in the end, the sort of the size, the comparison between the fleets and, and the losses, um, and I said over half of those coming off of, of uh, Beatty's battle cruisers. But uh, in the end, this has been something, you know, something of a disaster. Um, but it, the, the blame doesn't fix on 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 Beatty. Uh, in fact, Packenham uh, is is going to make a comment within uh, a, a day or so. Um, talking about this, that sort of the, the new approach is, is to shift the blame uh, from Jellicoe uh, for not engaging decisively, or rather to shift the blame onto Jellicoe for not engaging decisively, as opposed to Beatty for being rash. 
uh, and incurring such such great losses. Uh, but just in, in short, you know, Packenham in writing a letter um, essentially says that this wouldn't have happened if, if Beatty had been in charge of the whole group, that he would have pushed this thing to a conclusion. Uh, when Julian Corbett writes the official history and, and talks about the Battle of Jutland, it's highly critical of Beatty uh, and the Admiralty, which is under Beatty's control, then takes, again, the same line of argument uh, and includes their own sort of preface to, to the study, uh, saying that the conclusions that, that don't involve pressing a conflict to, to a decisive conclusion are at odds with what the Admiralty values. So, so Beatty, in a sense, is going to take refuge uh, in this idea of ethos uh, and avoid accountability for his lack of ability to actually control a battle or to have built a fleet uh, that would respond appropriately to the challenges that he had been warned about. Um, as I said, Bay will go on and, and be the, the, the first sea lord for a period of eight years, uh, has tremendous influence there. Andrew Lambert has argued that that's really where Beatty shined uh, the brightest. Um, that, that could be a, a topic for a, a, different, a different day. But I will say that as, as bad as Beatty was, the preservation of ethos goes on. Um, if you read The Hundred Days by, by Woodward, Woodward talks about feeling the pressure uh, of all those centuries of great British commanders as he was commanding forces off in the Falklands. And probably the, the, the best uh, remark on this to say, you know, like how important is ethos to an organization? Uh, and again, I believe the, the quote is taken from one of Churchill's histories, but uh, Andrew Brown Cunningham, commanding the Mediterranean fleet, uh, talking about saving uh, British soldiers uh, off Crete. Uh, it takes three years to build a ship. It takes three centuries to build a tradition. Uh, and so I offer this, you know, as, as poor a job as Beatty did, and, and as much as he tended to conflate his reputation uh, with the reputation of the Royal Navy, uh, the preservation of these things was, in a sense, essential uh, because the Royal Navy had to go on. And I don't think that they were in a position uh, where they could sacrifice uh, somebody that they had put so much stock in. Um, so that's essentially my critique uh, of, of Beatty and, and where the Royal Navy went. Uh, thank you for your time. So that's forward, that's back. Okay, sure. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I wouldn't do a one at a time. I'm not going to uh, consider the first part of the uh, title. Uh, this work is derived from a, a much broader essay, but I would be happy to entertain questions. Uh, about the faith that was exhibited by statesmen, British statesmen in Washington at the time of the Washington Conference. And the faith also of British officers who uh, the first believed that uh, any agreement that was implemented uh, would be followed by other nations. And, and the, the second, the officers, naval, British naval officers, they believed that uh, any agreement reached would be funded uh, by the British Treasury. I think uh, both were surprised along the way. So we may talk about that in the Q&A if we have time. Anyway, having conceded naval supremacy without a shot fired in anger, British officers in a dry Washington perhaps might not have cheered the results quite so fulsomely. But they too had reason to be thankful, if only because a greater peril had been avoided. An initial proposal to limit total British and American carrier tonnages to 80,000 tons, roughly equaling present Royal Navy strength, had been modified to a limit of 125,000 tons, thus allowing ample room for future growth. Better yet, all existing carriers had been deemed experimental and could be replaced by newer types. As only the Royal Navy so far possessed aircraft carriers and the knowledge gained from operating them, future construction would likely confirm this existing advantage. Additionally, the trap of opening research establishments, manufacturing plants, and naval magazines through outside inspections had been sidestepped. This was no small advantage given Britain's advantage in anti-submarine warfare painfully acquired and the steps already taken to improve the Navy's ordnance space on war experience. Well, to be sure, affairs in Washington only confirmed the strategic necessity of a Singapore naval base whose approval had been secured by the Admiralty the previous June. Uh, June. 
Well, that story does not lack for its own Boswell, but rather less, a whole lot less, has been recorded of the Navy's efforts to address the tactical implications of Washington. Thus, with overall parity conceded to the United States and superior superiority in local waters granted to Japan, the Admiralty sought to redress matters by ensuring tactical proficiency in battle. In truth, the test of the World War had made such a reorientation re necessary, never mind results secured at Washington. Still, the Washington Accords only emphasizes trend as recourse to outbuilding an adversary in the near term was forsaken. It was also a step that could largely proceed minus the intrusion of the cabinet and the treasury. Indeed, given the woeful performance of the Navy during the war, political support for correcting deficiencies in training and doctrine would be readily supported. For most executive, executive officer education, name one area right for tackling the fallout of the Washington Naval Treaty, with both the Royal Naval War College and the Royal Naval Staff College noting the new realities arising from the Washington Naval Agreement. As the surviving record is so patchy, drawing definitive conclusions is problematic, especially as the arms control regime was covered more generally in a series of six lectures offered to officers in international law. In 1926-27, only a single lecture of the more than 90 provided to officers that year explicitly covered the Washington Naval Agreement. Before that, and in 1922, the Washington Naval Agreement had featured as Commander Frederick Bennett's subject in the extended essay each officer was under instruction was required to write as part of their coursework. Following the successful completion of the staff course, Bennett remained at Greenwich as a lecturer where he focused on German naval operations during the late war. Thus, not even Bennett evidenced much interest in a manner fundamentally altering British naval circumstances. That the Staff College largely ignored the Washington Naval Conference is unsurprising, for preparing for the future always retained more resonance for that body than second-guessing the past. The same could be said of the Royal Naval War College, where flag officers, captains, and commanders were at the higher aspects of naval warfare. When re-established following the World War under Rear Admiral Sir Herbert Richmond, the War College offered a balanced curriculum covering policy, strategy, operations, and tactics. Doubtless this reflected the pedagogical inclinations of that officer, where overarching principles and the object of any enterprise remained as constant. Washington, however, challenged a key tenet of British naval orthodoxy, which readily assumed any war would be fought from a position of maritime superiority. Operationally, this maritime superiority might not always exist in all theaters, but strategically, and over the course of any war, it would tell in the end. From that superiority had stand Britain's ability to execute amphibious operations by employing second-line units. This had been a feature uh, throughout Britain's naval past, and Richmond now feared the conduct of future combined operations had been gravely compromised. One palliative would have been to uh, shift the supporting troops and transports rather than in older battleships or cruisers. But Richmond viewed that course with disfavor as the transports would not be able to provide the required gunfire support to any assault. Even if that worry had not existed, the problem of how to land tanks remained. Richmond saw ships such as the obsolete HMS Dreadnought as offering an ideal solution. Cut down as Razzies, the tanks could then be embarked on the open upper deck and hoisted over the side by the ship's 20-ton derrick. Clearly a mind closely attuned to the Royal Navy's past saw possibilities for solving current tactical dilemmas. But first, the ships had to be available. This included the ability of conducting future blocking operations such as Zabruga to neutralize the still very real threat posed by submarines to surface forces. For Richmond, the greatest problem with the Washington Agreement was that it viewed naval war as a discrete act, when in fact it was nations that went to war and not simply navies. This put at risk the very idea of the British way in warfare, where projecting the army upon a distant shore had allowed her to damage an enemy in a manner without fear of return. Even before Washington, Richmond had cautioned officers to refrain from assuming any fleet encounter would proceed from a position of strength. Such woolly thinking in the present fiscal environment was lethal, as, quote, 
a fighting officer must never commit tactical training to start from the assumption that we shall fight with superior force. The results of doing so are far-reaching. Action is cramped, risks are avoided, opportunities missed, and officers imagine that they can show, uh, shelter themselves behind the excuse that their numbers were not adequate." Unquote. In short, owing to the parity conceded to the United States and the burden of distance prevailing in the case of Japan, British assumptions of strategic superiority were no longer tenable. Another quick to appreciate the change environment was Lieutenant Commander Russell Grenfell. A, a recently qualified staff officer, Grenfell argued the existing means of tactical instruction were weighted towards mastering the employment of specific weapons rather than securing an appreciation of how best to employ all the means available in battle. The reasons for this gap in understanding were not hard to fathom, and then as the Navy spent but little time in mastering tactical theory in either the War College or the Staff College. Thus, in late 1923, Grenfell posited the need for a school dedicated to the study of tactics. That Grenfell's plea fell on deaf ears must not be attributed to the unsoundness of his proposal, for others, too, believed that strategic parity would beget tactical stalemate in battle. A recently promoted lieutenant commander in serving in the battleship HMS Iron Duke on the Mediterranean Station, Grenfell may have not been a prophet in the wilderness, but he stood removed from the mainspring of naval policy, the naval staff. One more attuned to the corridors of Whitehall was Rear Admiral Frederick Dreyer. Due to the service's leading gunnery expert, an erstwhile flag captain to Admiral Jellicoe in the Iron Duke at the Battle of Jutland, Dreyer successfully bridged the chat chasm and personalities that engulfed the service in the wake of that action. Viewed as pompous, Dreyer was not everybody's cup of tea, quote, universally distrusted and disliked in the service, unquote. The verdict remained Grenfell's, and allowing that officer might have uh, retained a special peak even he recognized Dreyer's unbounded talent. So too did Beatty, who saw Dreyer as an officer of no mean achievement. Shortly, the first sea lord would be able to assess such talents more closely, as Dreyer joined the Admiralty as Assistant Chief of Naval Staff in September 1924. In March 1924, however, Dreyer sat the senior officer's war course, where he was bold to criticize the paucity of tactical instruction within the Navy. As the 18-week course that year included at least five lectures on naval tactics, and maybe Dreyer's charge was aimed at the broader service rather than the war course itself. But be that as it may, Dreyer's palliative of establishing a dedicated tactical school as a necessary corrective proved too much for his peers. And in class that included three flag officers, the fawn of their objections may have stemmed from the messenger rather than the message. Yet the thought of seeing another shore establishment meddling in the affairs of the seagoing fleet and stacking the initiative of a float admiral should not be discounted, nor that officers deprecated attending courses ashore as this operated against the near sea time required to secure promotion. Warming to his subject, Dreyer ended his proration by vowing, quote, the tactical encounter is a culminating act in war and is therefore of supreme importance. For though bad strategy may be redeemed by successful tactics, there is no remedy for defeat in battle. As Assistant Chief of Naval Staff and the senior officer responsible for tactical side of the Naval Staff, Dreyer got the last laugh, for Beatty hardly endorsed the creation of a tactical school. The first Sea Lord's endorsement represented a climb down of sorts, for previously Beatty had avowed only material superiority would suffice for the service owing to the many naval secrets that had been shared with the United States Navy during the recent war to the detriment of its tactical advantage. Clearly, the present naval holiday and the strategic parity now accepted put paid the thoughts of maintaining Britain's sea supremacy through renewed construction. Only recourse to superior technique seemingly remained. The establishment of the tactical school in 1925 and the convening of its first course that March proved a watershed for the Royal Navy though few initially welcomed Dreyer's child with open arms. Its eight-week curriculum directly tied the formal doctrine of the service and the defined capabilities of British ships and aircraft against the presumed attributes of foreign counterbacks 
counterparts in mock battle. In time, the school would evaluate specific tactical problems set by the Admiralty to assist in developing effective counters for use in fleet engagements. Though it cannot be claimed the school only arose because of the period's treaty regime, after all, financial stringency remained a fact of life, the regime initiated at Washington made the venue ever the more necessary. Unsurprisingly, the Admiralty treated the creation of the tactical school and its curriculum as a closely held secret. Those assigned to the course were noted as enrolling in the Senior Officer's Technical Course, Part 2, with the school itself operating under cover of the Navigation School, HMS Dryad. This subterfuge proved difficult to sustain as officers of the Royal Air Force, also attending the course, began to confuse it with another venue, the Senior Officer's Technical Course, Part 1. Thus, in 1930, the Admiralty formally adopted the title Tactical Course in place of the Cumberson Appellation Senior Officers Technical Course Part 2. So evidently, one not confused, it was the United States Navy, which quickly learned of the school and its purpose. Another change following on from Washington treaty regime was the uh, steady allocation of British frontline naval strength from home waters to the Mediterranean Station. Proposed by the Director of Plans, Captain Barry Donville, in February 1922 to address the changed strategic situation, a corollary benefit touted was its aid in tactical training given the better climatic conditions existing in the Mediterranean. Of course, not all tactical changes stem from on high, with many originating with the seagoing fleets. Here, the efforts of Admiral Sir Charles Madden, the Commander-in-Chief of the Atlantic Fleet, came to the fore based on the evaluation of fleet exercises. Thus, Madden proposed that the primary objective of British submarines should now be the heavy ships of an enemy fleet and not as mercantile trade as had been enunciated at Washington. This recommendation stemmed from the extraordinarily successful attacks the third submarine flotilla had registered against the Atlantic Fleet's battle squadrons in exercises off the Balearic Islands. Six months later, and again drawing upon the lessons of recent Atlantic Fleet serials, Madden noted Britain's post-Atlantic battle fleet would not likely exceed 12 ships. Accordingly, he proposed increasing the distance between deployed battleships from two and a half to four cables, with, quote, with the object of decreasing the risk of hits by torpedoes without increasing the gunners, gunnery concentration difficulties or unduly increasing the length of the line, unquote. Man's suggestions soon won approval, and though the new cruising arrangements afforded a degree of protection from torpedo attack, the increased distance between divisions proved insufficient to allow a subordinate flag officer to, quote, to fight his division with real freedom without having constantly to consider the movements and distance away of the other divisions, unquote. As a presumed superior fleet, the Navy had deprecated battle at night between capital ships, believing its outcome owed too much to luck. Post-Washington, this stance changed, and while that treaty cannot be vouched the sole reason why, parity between fleets gave an impetus to perfecting its performance in a nighttime encounter. The gamut of interwar tactical training is well documented, in the series Progress and Tactics, which records the issues under investigation in the many serials executed by the fleets and squadrons of the Royal Navy. Many had their origins in the shortfalls identified in the service naval actions of the World War, reflected the incorporation of aircraft in fleet air operations, or appeared because Japan was now viewed as the most probable enemy. Yet other investigations owed their origins to the treaty regime initiated at Washington. Here one may cite the problem of a British fleet engaging a peer competitor whose force lacked the support of battle cruisers. This reference to the United States Navy post-Washington foreshadowed that the functions British battle cruisers perform must perforce be conditioned by the relative strength of the opposing battle fleet. All this Richmond would have approved, whereas he himself had noted, quote, while it is the business of the strategists and the organizers to bring a superior force against the enemy at the decisive point, it is the business of the tactician to fight with whatever force he has furnished, unquote. Looking on from 100 years, one might conclude that in the faith exhibited by statesmen in what had been secured at Washington, smacked of naivete, and that it was naval officers such as Dreyer, Grenfell, and Richmond who retained a truer appreciation of present verities. It, that would be too narrow a reading. The World War remained a haunting legacy for all. This included the United States, 
which might not be afforded as having which which might be afforded as having a good war. The proceedings opening on 12 November 1921, the day after an unknown soldier from that war had been interred at Arlington National Cemetery, the magnitude of what followed was not lost on Charles Evan Hughes, Arthur Balfour, and their peers. If they had aspired to do better, then they also accepted the results secured remained subject to that other verity in international discourse, rarely voiced but always present, gravest extensivist, and some the faith of statesmen, no less than professionals, who more limited, with all relying on that other surety, fear God and dread not. Everybody doesn't mind, I'm gonna take off my mask. I've been yeah. vaccinated, have all my shots. Spade and neuter, everything went down, so I'm good to go. Now you tell me. Now I <laughs> uh, I'll give my disclaimer that Chuck gave. Uh, the views expressed by me are not the views of the U.S. government, but they should be. Uh, uh, my topic today is going to talk about the Merch Marine Act of 1920, what I refer to as America's first national maritime strategy. Not naval strategy, but maritime strategy. And one of the things that we talk about a lot with regards to sea power is the military application of sea power, the naval application. Unfortunately, what we don't tend to talk about is the commercial application, how the commercial merchant marine is used by militaries to execute sea power. In the post-World War I era, there are two events that really dominate that time period. The first is the Grand Scuttle. It, it is the scuttle of the high seas fleet up at Scapa Flow on June 21st, uh, 1919 just prior to the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, Admiral von Ritter wants to get rid of the fleet so it's not turned over to the Allies, so it won't fall into Allied hands, and so he executes the, the Grand Scuttle, with most of the fleet winding up in the bottom of the flow. Then, a few years later, we have the Washington Naval Conference, November 12th to 1921, the February 6th of 1922, the major nations, the British, the Americans, the Japanese, the, Je uh, the German, excuse me, the, the, the uh, Italians and the French, all meet in Washington to discuss about the size and limitations of it. And as we all know the details, one of the treaties that comes out of that conference is the Five Power Treaty, which gives us the infamous 553 ratio, which sets the amount of capital ships that each of these nations can have, with the ratio of 553 referring to the US, the British, and the Japanese. For Italians and French get 1.67. Italians never get the respect they deserve. Uh, <laughs> What is not commonly referred to is the agreements that happen regarding the commercial merchant marine. Uh, in the Treaty of Versailles, Article 244, Annex 3, specifically deals with the fate of the German merchant marine. Under that article, all vessels over 1,600 gross tons were to be surrendered to the Allies. Vessels between 1,000 and 1,600 gross tons, 50% were to be surrendered to the Allies and 25% of all fishing and trawler vessels to the Allies. Basically, the Germans were to be stripped of their commercial merchant marine. The ships above there represent probably the pinnacle of the German merchant marine. Those are the three Imperata-class uh, liners used by the Hamburg-America line. The one on the left there was the Vaterland. She became USS Leviathan during World War I, transported over 98,000 American troops during the First World War. The other two are the Imperator herself in the middle, and on the right is the Bismarck. Uh, both those vessels will eventually be handed over to the British to replace the lost Lusitania and Britannic, becoming the Berengaria and the Majestic. But before Berengaria, the vessel in the middle, is turned over, Imperator became a subject of issues between the U.S. and the British. The U.S. required vessels to return the American Expeditionary Force. Because while the British assisted transporting the American Expeditionary Force to France, they transport 49% of the AEF, at the end of World War I, the United States transports 82% of the AEF back. The British do not make their vessels available to them for a variety of reasons. Number one, they have to return British troops, they have to return Dominion troops, but most importantly, they need to get their vessels back onto the major trade routes. And so Imperata, along with eight other vessels, which were in Germany during the war, Bismarck had not been finished yet, were handed over to the Americans on a short-term basis. 
and in one of the great moments in U.S. history for a very short time in the history of the United States Navy, there was a USS Imperata. That's just a great name right there. <laughs> uh, just fantastic. What a hack that says that. Uh, the uh, fate of the German Merchant Marine was very significant to both the Americans and the British because of events that happened during the First World War, particularly the shipbuilding program. The graph there on the left shows you the shipbuilding of Britain and the United States. The United States is that small little line at the bottom on the left. The British Merchant Marine is on the top throughout until you hit 1917, and then it's flipped. And this issue is one of the big concerns that the British had, that during World War I, the Americans initiated an emergency shipbuilding program that absolutely put them in second place. Uh, during the war, the British shifted their production, cut merchant ship production in half to focus on the construction of combatants, largely dreadnoughts initially, and then shifting over to escort vessels. But unfortunately, the British suffered from the first and second unrestricted submarine warfare and they had to shift back over to ship construction, merchant ship construction. And in 1917, they put in, well, actually 1916, they established a shipping control office to pool their shipping. They hadn't done that yet. So one of the things they begin to do is nationalize their merchant marine. But in 1917, they implement standardization designs to get more vessels out. But in the meantime, the United States program is leaving the British behind. And the big fear is, again, Nobody knows but us, as good historians, that the war ends on November 11th, 1918. They're planning for this war to go into 1919, conceivably 1920, at which point the U.S. Merchant Marine would far exceed the British Merchant Marine. And this goes back to events prior to American entry in World War I. In 1916, the United States initiates the Naval Act. The Naval Act of 1916 aims to create a Navy of large combatants, 10 battleships, the four Colorados, the six South Dakotas, six Lexington-class battle cruisers, 10 Omaha-class light cruisers, 50 destroyers, a Navy second to none. Basically, really put a, a, a grave challenge to, to the British. What's not commonly referred to and not commonly known is at the same time, a shipping act was passed in 1916. This is known as the Alexander Act, the John Alexander Democrat from Missouri. He puts in process what's we call, what eventually becomes the U.S. Shipping Bureau the very first U.S. government agency to basically oversee merchant shipping. They form an emergency fleet corporation to initiate ship construction, because uh, one of the issues that had happened to the United States in 1914 is U.S. goods were left at the dock. When World War I happened, the British Merchant Marine and the German Merchant Marine were nowhere to be found. The German Merchant Marine ran for cover, a lot of vessels into American ports. The British Merchant Marine was diverted to carrying trade for the military, and American goods piled on the docks could not be exported. And so one of the things that the Shipping Act aimed to do was prevent that. They create the Emergency Fleet Corporation uh, to build vessels. They uh, give it $50 million to initiate a shipbuilding program. They uh, acquire vessels for use as naval auxiliaries. They start regulating commerce. And most importantly of all, they want to get the United States prepared to be self-sufficient and get American ships onto international trade routes. Most American ships prior to World War I were in the coastwise trade. Remember, there's no interstate highway system. There's no interstate pipeline system. So large deep draft vessels are being used, particularly now with the advent of the Panama Canal and getting them across. That use of American ships in international trade runs into a little bit of problem in 1917. And uh, as, as Rodney Carlyle makes his argument in Sovereignty at Sea, it's not the Zimmerman telegram that gets us into World War I. I'm sorry, Barbara, Barbara Tuckman, wherever you are. Uh, it, is, it is the fact that 10 American ships are sunk, 64 merchant mariners are, are killed. And again, if you don't believe me, read Wilson's statement to Congress. He speaks about the Zimmerman telegram once, and he talks the rest of the time about the sinking of ships as an attack on American sovereignty. And that attack is what's going to eventually lead to it. Uh, in World War I, Wilson will eventually appoint two people that unfortunately don't ever get attention in World War I. That's going to be Edward Hurley as the head of the U.S. Shipping Bureau and Charles Schwab, who doesn't just sell you insurance, but was actually the head of the Emergency Fleet Corporation. And Hurley and Schwab will initiate a five-step program to get the United States the ships it needs through commandeering, through nationalization, and most importantly, through the construction of a massive shipbuilding program 
that is paled only by the shipbuilding program of World War II. During World War I, the United States has to take part in the deployment and fielding of a two million person American Expeditionary Force, 43 divisions. That's what gets over there. The envisionment is 80 divisions, 4 million troops coming across. There was a uh, panel earlier today when they were talking about World War I, they were talking about World War II logistics, and they said the view of World War I naval logistics, U.S. Navy logistics, was it was simple. It was one theater, it was an easy stream, and I would vehemently disagree with that. I think there was a lot of issues for the United States to deploy 36 destroyers to Queenstown, to the units to Brest, units to Gibraltar. Uh, American Navy had to take over 10 German, uh, 10 German freighters, turn them into cargo vessels, had to commandeer six tankers from the U.S. Merchant Marine to provide the oil for those destroyers that were running around there. There was a lot. To get the support for the AEF by the end of the war, the Naval Overseas Transportation Service, which was created in January of 1918, goes from 73 ships to 450 ships with another 200 earmarked to be deployed over and transferred as they come online. And not to mention the transport of the AEF. In the first half of the war for the United States from roughly uh, April of 1917, all the way through March of uh, 1918, the United States is able to deploy six divisions to Europe. But the fact is we lack the adequate transportation to get more ship divisions over. The reason divisions don't leave in large numbers till March is because the National Guard, the National Army divisions, the 32 of them show up in camps in July and August of 1917, it takes six months to train them. That coincides with the Kaiserschlag, the uh, Kaiser's attack, the spring offensive, which scares the British. And for the first time, the British agreed to release 124 ships to the U.S. for four months to transport over 24 divisions with the caveat that the first 10 divisions that come over go to the British sector. And, uh, and after that, the Americans are on their own for really transporting their forces over. And so the Americans come out of World War I, the Navy, with the experience that we need a merchant marine to draw upon for auxiliary vessels, cargo vessels, tankers, and for transports. There's a massive shipbuilding program underway to build 99 troop, troop ships during World War I. The British come out of the war with a different perspective. They got hammered. Uh, the British Merchant Marine suffers greatly. During the course of the war, the British Merchant Marine will fall 14.6%. Uh, they, they'll be at 18 million tons. Now, they're still the biggest Merchant Marine in the world, but they took a serious hammer. But the number that scares them the most is the United States. The United States grows 78.2%. They're at 9.6 million. That's in October of 1918. The most ships the U.S. will build will be in 1919 going into 1920. And so the British sit there poised for the Americans to be compatible with them going forward. Again, we talk about 553, we talk about the U.S. being even with the British in terms of battleships, but what the British did not want is the U.S. to be even with them in terms of commercial vessels. Why is this happening? Why is all of a sudden this program such a massive threat to the British? And why are the Americans now all of a sudden doing it? We've talked about the military. Aspect, but there's also a technological aspect that the U.S. are doing that the British are terrified of. The shipbuilding program built by the United States, which is massive, 3,148 ships planned, 2,314 completed. Again, paled only by what we do in World War II, building 5,777 ships. The ships we're building, while they're a mixed bag, you have steel vessels, you have some weird wooden ships, which you can go see sunk at Mallows Bay right now. Uh, there's some concrete vessels. But there's an overwhelming number of them are steel modern vessels, very large, you know, 8,000 ton cargo vessels like the West Class, like the Hog Islanders. But what makes those vessels so scary to the British is the fact that they're oil fired. They use oil as their main propulsion fuel. Prior to World War I, coal was the major fuel source for all vessels. And the British had a huge advantage in this. Not that they had more coal than us, but they had overseas bases from which where to coal. If you use coal on a, on a commercial ship, coal takes up a lot of room. It steals from your cargo space. And if you need to refuel overseas, you need to have coal stockpile. If you don't have those coal stockpiles overseas, you need to bring enough coal for the return voyage. That steals from your cargo holds. Oil changes the entire scenario because oil is stored in the double bottom. It doesn't take up any room. In fact, it takes the place of your ballast. 
And now all of a sudden it's also more efficient. You get more power out of it. You can steam longer ranges. And the U.S. doesn't need Singapore, Gibraltar, Aden, Falkland. They don't need bases. They can go wherever they want. And that's the threat the Americans see on the high seas, is that American ships are going to come out and now rival the British for their entity. And that's why the U.S., immediately after World War I, attempts to create a maritime strategy to enact this. Three major players. On the right there, Congressman William Stedman Green in 1919 will introduce a bill that will eventually become the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. On the left, the first CNO of the Navy, William S. Benson, becomes the third chairman of the U.S. Shipping Board. And as the chairman of the U.S. Shipping Board in 1920, he says this, Constant protection can only come from an ample Navy and a permanent merchant marine. Under our own flag, a merchant fleet of adequate size for a peacetime commerce, manned by American citizens whose loyalty will keep them at their posts when dangers come and whose experience will equip them for higher office in our non-combatant fleet when it serves as an auxiliary to our Navy is not a mere instrument of commerce, it is a necessity. Benson gives the justification for the government to remain in the business of shipping and actively states with his experience as the first chief of naval operations during World War I why we need to have it. In the center is Senator Wesley Jones. Wesley Jones will have a hearing on this, a massive 2,000-page hearing. Fantastic reading. Recommended to everyone. <laughs> Fantastic. Everyone in the merchant industry is there. They all talk about it. And what Wesley Jones comes away with, and this is the, the, the act is referred to as the Jones Act. You'll hear that term used a lot with it. He says this. When the war began, we had practically no ships under the American flag on the high seas. Practically the only shipping we had was in our coastwise trade, built up under our coastwise laws. One of the provisions left of this law that still exists today is the protection for the coastwise fleet. This is why it's in there. And if we had not built up the merchant marine under the coastwise laws, the result of this war might have been far different. We want to build up our merchant marine in the foreign trade, the overseas trade. We had no such merchant marine when the war broke out. Ships alone do not make a merchant marine. They must have cargoes, they must have traffic, they must have business, or they will be laid up or sold to foreign countries. Routes must be established and trade developed to maintain them. And so right from the very beginning, one of the things we see is the United States pushes aggressively to get out on the overseas trade lanes. Routes that did not exist prior to World War I, we'll see American ships on them, American companies. If there are not American companies willing to get on those routes, then U.S. companies or U.S government corporations will be created to get them on the route and then sold to commercial interests. And as those ships get out there, we see the decline in the shipbuilding start to happen. And the U.S. poses a major threat at this time. The act goes into law in June of 1920. This is the preamble to the act, where it states basically here for everybody and including the U.S. and also the British. Uh, that is necessary for the national defense and for proper growth of its foreign and domestic commerce that the United States will have a merchant marine of the best equipped, most suitable vessel, types of vessels sufficient to carry the greater portion of its commerce and serve as a naval or military auxiliary in time of war or national emergency. This law uh, that's created is a massive bill, 39 sections, and what it does, it takes previous laws, it codifies them into one law, it establishes the principle of sailing the ships built by the U.S. Uh, shipping board, the Emergency Fleet Corporation, to sell them out there and to ensure there's an American presence on the high seas, something that was lacking just before World War I. The issue comes, but it kind of falls flat. Why is this not a big issue at the Washington Naval Conference? Why is this removed by the time late 1921, 1922? Change in administration, the Harding administration comes in, we have to return to normalcy. And one of the elements of return to normalcy was to get the government out of commercial industries, denationalize, turn things over. And so Harding orders his new chairman of the U.S. Shipping Board to basically start turning everything back over, commercialize it. He orders the sale of the last of the vessels in the fleet sold off. However, because he's also fighting to eliminate the national debt, he wants to sell those vessels for the cost of in, for for the exact dollar it costs to build them. And unfortunately, during World War I, ships were built at very fast pace. They were premium vessel ships. And what wound up happening is a lot of vessels did not get sold. And the U.S. Merchant Marine doesn't become the major threat that the British sees. Now, the U.S. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Last slide. 
while the U.S. Merchant Marine does not become the number one merchant marine in the world at the time of World War II, it does become the second. And it is present in the Pacific, in the Atlantic, in the Indian Ocean, along the American coast. And most importantly of all, lessons are learned from this. Subsequent laws, the Merchant Marine Act of 1928 will build additional passenger vessels, which help supplement the troop transports, which weren't finished at the end of World War I. And then the Merchant Marine Act of 1936, which was the brainchild of a little assistant secretary of the Navy called Franklin Delano Roosevelt, will initiate an act which will allow the beginning of the construction of a naval program and an auxiliary ship program built to a standardized design that will start pumping out ships in 1937 so that by the time December 7th, 1941, the products of that fleet are present at Pearl Harbor. USS Neosho is one of those ships built in that program. The first Liberty ships are down the ways in September of 1941. And basically in the first 50 ships built in a 500 ship initial program, 37 of them will find themselves into military service. The other 13 will provide essential commercial service. The arsenal of democracy that is essential to win World War I is useless if you can't get it from the home front to the battlefront. And really it's the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, that first piece of maritime strategy that allows us to get victory in the World War II was a direct result of World War I. Thank you. Commentary this afternoon is going to be given by uh, another member of the faculty at the Air Force Academy, uh, Dr. John Abadiello. But uh, unless you think he is an air power enthusiast, he may be, but he also is a scholar of naval matters uh, and has written a very well known study called Anti Submarine Warfare in World War I. And uh, John is going to do the commentary for us. Thank you, sir. I want to make sure your eyes are being saved from that camera uh, no, we're or the uh, projector. We're good. Okay. And I think I'll drop my mask as well if you guys don't mind. Well, thank you all. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to comment on these three excellent papers by, <laughs> by three superb historians. Um, and thanks for sticking it out today. Uh, I know I do realize that it's late on a Friday afternoon and, and I am probably more thirsty than all of you are. But we're almost done. But uh, I want to offer just a few comments, maybe six or seven minutes, and then open it up for questions, because I'm sure you have many. Uh, and and for, for the three presenters, I will ask each of you a single question during my comments. You don't have to answer right away. You don't have to answer at all if you don't want to. Uh, we'll save that for discussion, perhaps, later. Um, so not surprisingly, our three presenters discuss aspects of some very big ideas. Ideas that should be on all of our minds uh, as sea power historians or for as many of us who are here, uh, the idea should be on our minds as educators, I think. Dr. Chuck Steele uses the example of Admiral David Beatty in discussing the ethos of the Royal Navy during the Great War and immediately thereafter. Dr. Steele argues that Beatty, who's, by the way, titles later include, included uh, Earl Beatty, Viscount Boredale of Wexford, and Baron Beatty of the North Sea and of Brooksby, uh, if you're interested. Um, but he represented an ethos that valued courage over competence, and that the Royal Navy chose to preserve this ethos over mastering new technology and the employment of that new technology. Dr. Steele highlights the well-known shortcomings that Beatty uh, demonstrated at Dogger Bank in Jutland and in writing the history of the war, for example. But if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'd like to dig a little deeper into this idea of ethos and, and maybe compare it to organizational culture, which is close. Uh, not necessarily the same, but close, um, that Dr. Steele looks at. Some of you may be familiar with the theories of social psychologist Edgar Schein, uh, who wrote extensively on organizational culture. Schein argues that three things define an organization, an organization's culture. Basic assumptions, uh, the core beliefs of the members of the organization, espoused values, what does that organization say about itself to the public, and artifacts. Closely related to the other two, uh, but what are the out, outward signs or symbols uh, of the organization? And for that, you might think of contemporary postcards that uh, sailors up in Scapa Flow were sending home with battleships on the postcards or, or the portrait of, uh, of Beatty that, uh, that Chuck showed us earlier. So I'll generalize, generalize for the sake of brevity. I think in all three areas, again, basic assumptions, espoused values, 
and public facing artifacts. Uh, there we see a Royal Navy culture that arguably focuses on the following things. Since the time of the Spanish Armada, actually, on courage and bravery, on technical skill, on the employment of excellent material, on exercising initiative, and on respecting tradition. So those two might have some tension there. We could list a few more, and we could debate about those that I mentioned. But Dr. Steele argues that the Royal Navy in general, and Beatty in particular, focused on courage at the expense of developing subordinate leaders in their technical skill. And the examples he used are you know, communications and signaling, gunnery, fire control, and so forth. My question for Dr. Steele, if he wishes to address it later, uh, would be, was Beatty more guilty than his peers in not developing his subordinates adequately? Or is he simply par for the course uh, of his generation of naval officers in the Royal Navy when it comes to uh, this rapid technological change and keeping up with it? Moving on to Dr. Joe Moretz's paper. Uh, here we see the Royal Navy realizing that the Washington Naval Agreement of 1922 would drive foundational changes to how the Navy planned, trained, and educated for future conflict. No longer would Britain rely on naval supremacy, uh, would rely on naval supremacy based on a numerically superior fleet. Treaties indeed affect not only strategy and policy, but can also have an effect on tactics. Luckily for Britain, the Royal Navy enjoyed the services of several innovative thinkers who paid attention to the impact of the Washington Treaty on naval tactics. Leaders and thinkers such as Richmond, Grenfell, Dreyer, and Madden wrestled with this impact in the 1920s and beyond. The establishment of the Tactical School in 1925 institutionalized this emphasis. Thinking on various tactical questions, including night engagements, the use of aircraft with the fleet, how to best employ the capability of, of submarines, and so forth, Focus the Royal Navy's officers on developing their technical skill. Tactical fleet exercises accompanied improvements in professional education, a true blend of theory and practice in many an officer's career. My question for Dr. Moretz is, again for later, do you think the initiatives you presented made a difference in changing the Royal Navy's organizational culture from one that looked to history and tradition to one that was more focused on the future fight? And we'll save that for later if you'd like. Switching gears to the United States, Dr. Macagliano's presentation addressed the context behind and the impact of the American Merchant Marine Act of 1920. Here we heard about the importance of the Merchant Marine and the major powers during the Great War with a focus on how the United States leveraged intern shipping, new production, and political processes to build up its merchant fleet. The Merchant Marine Act institutionalized American ownership and operation of coastal shipping in the 1920s, among other things, uh, to provide the nation with a reserve of vessels to be used in future conflict. So my question for Dr. M is, uh, did that coastal shipping actually get used during World War II? Um, uh, just curious if, if it was suitable, if that plan really worked the way it was designed. Later acts of Congress, such as in 1928 and 1936, continued the theme of seeing the American Merchant Marine as a national security asset. And as Dr. Macagliano argues, this emphasis indeed put the U.S. in direct competition with Britain, but also in his paper, quote, proved essential for success in the Second World War. I think his larger point about the importance of a strong merchant marine to a nation's sea power is key here. And I think it's the basis for a thread of continuity uh, across all three papers. As I see it, our three excellent papers made one point very clear, that sea power derives from much more than just navies. Um, <laughs> Dr. Moretz said earlier, nations go to war and not just navies. Yes, sea power is about combat power at sea, but it's also about a constellation of other issues, all demonstrated during this session. These are big ideas. Uh, as important today as they were 100 years ago. Sea power relies on both a maritime and naval component. It relies on institutions and laws and treaties. It relies on positive culture. And underneath all of that, it relies on leadership, both naval and civilian. Here, I think of Dr. Steele's critical examination of David Beatty, Dr. Moretz's mentioning of Herbert Richmond, and Dr. Macagliano's emphasis on Edward Hurley early in his paper. All leaders who had a tremendous impact on sea power. 
To these and the other leaders mentioned today, we owe a great deal. Uh, they were passionate about sea power, and we're, we're sure glad they were. I hope you're not surprised that someone who serves the Service Academy's Center for Character and Leadership Development uh, talked a little bit about leadership at the end of my comments. But thanks for indulging me. Uh, and back to Professor Chad Bourne to, to lead on uh, with the discussion. Thanks to all of our excellent presenters. Um, thank you, gentlemen, all for a very thoughtful presentation. What I'd like to do is uh, we have about 10 minutes here for Q&A. Do we have any questions from our virtual participants by any chance? Yes, they can feel free to come up and eat or uh, submit a question in the prompt that I'm about to give them. Okay, very good. If any come in, please interrupt us and bring up the floor. We're very glad to have them with us. So, folks, the uh, floor is over here. Question. Um, yeah. Sal, uh, speaking of the impact of the Jones Act and the intent of meeting with the British, what is Again, given your earlier comments about we should listen to what you have to say to U.S. policy, how does the, what does the Jones Act say as a as an indicator for the current situation? With when the, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said that the United States is a maritime nation and that we should be prepared for great power com uh, competition, what does that say about the United States vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese and their ability to build ships? And what is of the American merchant marine in that competition. If you look at um, so if you look at uh, the, the the elements that happen here, one of the things that I argue is is First World War, Second World War, your first last period period conflicts, obviously. And one of the things, and I go back to the statement by um, Senator Jones talking about the fact that if we did not have a coastwise domestic fleet, we couldn't have that international fleet. If we didn't have that international fleet. We would not have the ability to put our fleet into an auxiliary service for the military, and I, th I think it's, I think it's essential. I think one of the things that this this looks at, and what they attempted to do with the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 and subsequent acts, 28 and 36, was to ensure that there was a a, a pool of vessels. To go back to the question that John had talking about the the coastal shipping, I think it's absolutely essential. I said because these are not small vessels; these are vessels that are operating between major ports, and again. It, it's an argument that the U.S. comes into World War One as the third-ranked merchant marine in the world and found itself very near in, in, a, in a dire situation. From 1914 to 1917, there was an economic recession. We could not move cargo out of the country. We were economically stymied by that. We had to initiate the program, which led to the 1916 Act. Uh, World War II, we were already shipping goods. We were already, you know, we were much more dependent. And what that allowed us to do is almost immediately shift over to deployment of forces. And support our forces into Europe, into you know the Australia route, and do it today. It, it's much different. Again, today you're, you're talking about a nation that has the number one navy in the world, us, and the number twenty one merchant marine in the world, whereas China is number two in both. And 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 that you know makes the argument. And it goes back to the definition of sea power. Your definition is being able to throw cruise missiles off a submarine and and launch F A H you know Hornets off off a nuclear carrier. Yeah, we're sea power. But if you're Argument is to do both commercial and military. Then, are we a true sea power or not? And I, th I think one of the issues, longer issue, and again, I said the best pa papers today talking about logistics, is it's taken for granted. It, it, it's the concept is it's it's going to be there. Uh, the, the, you know, I, I said on a, on a paper on Richmond and Kelly Turner, and and not once was the topic of merchant marine talked about. You know, there was no shipping commercial shipping talked about, and you know, it was absolutely essential in that first six months of the war. To be able to pull merchant ships, to be able to put troops on the Canton, Christmas, Bora Bora, you know, Fiji, Samoa, you know, and it's not a big topic in World War II history in the Pacific, but it's really a race between the British and I mean the Japanese and the Americans to get to those islands. And we needed that shipping to do that. And, and I think that's the element that this that I try to do with this paper is convey that. And what has happened is 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 that strategy has slowly been dismantled over time to where it's at today. What is that old saying that uh Professional I mean, amateurs talk about strategy and professionals talk about logistics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. a, a follow on to that, Sal. And uh, the same argument came up prior to prior and during the Gold War, where merchant, our merchant marine was very low in terms of numbers, yet we are able to call on the whole world merchant marine charters. You know, you know all the details about that. And I always thought 
American industry is complaining about this, yet we always manage to put together this massive global effort for a common good. I, I, it's not in this paper, but in a study I did, I looked at how the British, for example, were able to transport half a million troops in the first six months of World War One. I. I mean, they were able to deploy the Indian Expeditionary Force, the, the, the Australians, the New Zealanders, Canadians. And, and that's because they had, not only did they have the shipping to do it, but they had com control of the sea. They had command of the sea, which is a key thing. And I think one of the things that we, we people don't realize today is, is that the U.S. Navy and the British Navy, in large part, provided the freedom of the seas that a country like China, for example, benefits greatly upon. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they don't have to patrol the seas. Right. They don't have to make sure that their shipping is. <laughs> and that's why the Liberian, Panamanian, uh, you know, and Marshall Island flags don't have to have navies to go out to protect them. Because, you know, we have guaranteed freedom of the seas. And that creates a, an unbalanced playing field. I think that's why you see a lot of studies right now out of out of out of Joint Chiefs, the Defense Department, and all the branches, looking at contested logistics. What happens? You know, because we've never had to deal with it. We really haven't. You know, I, you know as well as I did. Say for Vietnam, it was easier to haul a ton of cargo from San Francisco to Saigon than it was to haul a ton of, of cargo from 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 uh, Hanoi. I mean, from uh, from. Uh, from uh, Hanoi down uh, into South Vietnam, and then we haven't been contested at all in our logistics in any way, and now there's potential for it. Sorry, I'm going to monopolize. Speaking of freedom of the sea, uh, and this is tied Sal and Joe's papers maybe together, um, Herbert W. Richmond was engaged in arguments with Colonel House um, in the late 1920s about freedom of the sea. I wonder if that was brought on by this Big increase in the American size of the American merchant marine. You know, we were okay uh, during, you know, it seems like the, the United States is, is okay to set aside freedom of the sea when we're at war, and when we're not at war, it becomes a big, uh, it becomes another fundamental issue. Well, Richmond, I think, has a lot of problems with the Americans because I think, first and foremost, he doesn't view it as a maritime power, he sees it as a continental power, whereas the British Empire truly is a maritime power. The seas or its lifeblood. And so Richmond looks at the United States and its demand for large cruisers okay, or and large ships, period. And he just says, this isn't rational. Uh, so now, when you look at Richmond, you have to be careful because Richmond is not the typical Royal Navy officer in his thinking. He's very much, in some respects, an outlier. He's brilliant, but he's an outlier in some regards. But I think that's what Richmond's real concern about is he doesn't see, uh, and of course he's British, right? But he doesn't see the American, when you look at the United States, let's say 1919 or let's say 1927 when he becomes Commandant of the Imperial Defense Corps, what are America's overseas obligations? The Philippines, Guam, Hawaii, Puerto Rico? Uh, I mean, what are Britons? Who has the need for a large navy? Who has a need for a large merchant marine? And one thing I will say about Richmond, he does have a true appreciation of maritime power, not just sea power. So one of the things he does at the war course is he has his officers uh, touring the docks of London, right? He brings in the Lloyd Shipwriters. He brings in the RAF, okay, to say, okay, how do Britain maximize its maritime wherewithal? Right? What do we have to defend? How do we use it? So I, I think... Uh, Richmond is chagrined because he looks at the United States wanting to be a uh, equal to Britain in sea power, but it doesn't have the need for it. It's for Britain, for uh, the United States, it's one of prestige. That's what uh, Richmond would see. Well, he was arguing for the, for the British to be able to retain the right to stop in search and shipping that one. Oh, oh uh, absolutely, absolutely. Because what is the British means of executing their naval strategy? No. Nope. Okay. Blockade, contraband control, economic warfare, call it what you will, and amphibious combined operations. You know, well, the army, the British army, is a force to be landed on another shore. That's why the Marines are so small, because the entire British army is an expeditionary force. Yeah. You know? I, I, I argue that uh, Wilson, you know, the point number one of the 14 points is freedom of the seas. And, and everyone, everyone associates that with the German U-boat offensive, but... Wilson would tell you that it wasn't just freedom of the seas. One of the things he envisioned it was with the British gone, with, with American goods, you know, cotton goes from 35 cents a, a, a ton to transport to $6.10 a ton to transport. 
he sees an opportunity for the United States. If we had the shipping, we can get into the South American markets, we get the Asian markets, and most importantly, by the time the British come back, we will already be on there and be economically independent of ourselves, and we'd have a sure supply lines all the time. And again, I, I think all too often we, we look at it with the military side and we don't look at that, that, that equal comparable side, because I think that's what Wilson's looking at. He, he wants a very famous book by Jeffrey Safford, which talked about Wilson's maritime diplomacy, and that was one of the economic aspects he really wanted to talk about. I see we have some questions coming in from our virtual participants. My, my, if I call your attention to uh, my colleague, John Scott Lowe from Naval War College, uh, and uh, I think Joe or Chuck, either one of you might uh, comment on, on that. It's, it's projected on the board behind you. You all read that, I assume? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, uh, it, it kind of requires a, a crystal ball of sorts. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, who, who might produce a, a, a baby at, at this point? And uh, I think that's, you know, I don't think anybody would want to do that. Uh, yeah. Supposedly, I mean, even the British, I think, came to the conclusion that uh, uh, they, they would pull back a little bit from their veneration of, of Beatty. Uh, I think that the two King George V battleships became Howe and Anson. I think we were supposed to be uh, originally Beatty and Jellico, but uh, uh, they thought better of that. So, um, you know, I, I think that. I, I mean, I like the question. I, I, I think it's interesting. We, we talk ethos a lot at, at the Air Force Academy. Uh, we have a, a, a committee on warrior ethos. Uh, it's tied to a number of course outcomes. Uh, I've been on that committee before, and, and I, I think the term is kind of, kind of dangerous, um, and especially in, in, in this day and age. That, uh, for one, I don't like the term warrior ethos. Uh, it's Maybe the Royal Navy came closer to this than anybody else when you think about how young uh, people were when they started their, their naval training, that, that maybe you know, the, the culture was uh, sort of all-consuming from a very early age, so maybe you did create an, you know, truly warriors. Uh, but you know, in, in this day and age, you, you take young people who have already gone through high school uh, and what you're hoping to develop are military professionals. I mean, that, that, you know, it's in their adult years. You're not acculturating them you know, from, from the earliest of times. But I would certainly hope that when we do this, that it, um, in, in a different conference, I talked about ethos and education, in a sense, being in an adversarial relationship. Uh, because one is asking you, in a sense, to, to, to feel or, 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 or act from the heart, whereas the other, I think, you know, requires you to, to really think your way through problems. And, and so I think, you know, anybody would be susceptible to this. Uh, depending upon how great the appeal to emotion is, uh, people who favor heritage over history, I, I think, are in danger of, of uh, creating an ethos uh, as opposed to creating people who are, are you know, principally thinkers. Um, and so I, I couldn't name somebody specifically, but I think if you're all in on ethos, uh, I think that you run the chance of, of retarding the development uh, of your people and, you know, to be proficient professionals. We are, we are kind of, well, I just want to add on. I think one thing that separates, you know, the Royal Navy of 100, 120 years ago from what exists today is communications, right? Modern communications. And so naval officers in the late 19th century, early 20th century were expected to show initiative in a manner that today will be put down because they're subject to <clears throat> civilian control because civilian control can be exercised via modern command and control systems. Those things did not exist in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, and I think a lot of discretion was given by the foreign office and the colonial office to how Royal Naval officers operated as long as they were operating in the spirit of what the national policy is. Today, I think officers within the Royal Navy are more constrained. First off, the Royal Navy is a more constrained force. So, but the other thing is, any incident can very quickly become a global, international incident. And so, I think there's much more tighter control exercise at the national level than existed, let's say, 100, 120 years ago. We are out of time, but I'm going to take one more question from virtual. And if any of you have one last question, we'll do that. Uh, this question is. Uh, uh, 
come from the Netherlands. Uh, uh, Randall Ooms is a serving officer in the Netherlands Navy, who is also a great student of uh, naval history. Yeah, that question, uh, did the U.S. interwar merchant marine policy consider any preparations for defensive armament of merchant vessels, and if so, would they bear the cost? Uh, the Merchant Marine Act of 36, when they built the standardized vessels, had provisions in there for naval armament. So they were hard points fitted onto the vessels. Uh, they were included in there. Some vessels, for example, there was a series of 12 tankers that were built uh, under the original building program in 1936 that were built with twin screw, uh, enlarged engine rooms uh, for more speed and suitable for conversion into underwear replenishment ships. The companies that operated them, SO, which is Monday, Exxon and, and, and Keystone, were given additional money to offset the costs to maintain those vessels and operate those vessels. And those vessels became the main fast oilers for the U.S. Navy in World War II. They supported the fast carriers during uh, 1942, these the Sabine, the Guadalupe, the Osho. Uh, four of them were converted into escort carriers, the Sagamon class. So, uh, you know, one of the things that they, they found out was it was very essential to have vessels suitable for conversion into uh, auxiliaries, and even if not going into auxiliaries for defensive armament, for the embarkation of naval armed guards on board, defensive armament. So that was, that was a provision that was included in, and that came out of World War One, where there was a it was an expensive process. If you look what happened in World War One, almost one of the best benefits of U.S. battleships having so many ridiculous number of guns on them was they could be stripped off and used as secondary armament on on vessels. They literally would just take crew. The very first naval armed guards on U.S. ships in World War One came from the battleship Arizona, they, and it wasn't just the armed guards that literally took the five inch guns off the Arizona and put them on there. And so uh, it was a benefit. It, it, it was a benefit to being able to do that. You know, today with with modular weapons, with 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 hand weapons, uh, it, it's provision that can be included. We're seeing it more and more being done. Any last questions from the audience here? Yeah? Well, listen, have a wonderful weekend, and thank you very much for our conversation. <laughs> Good job. Good to see you. Thanks, Ed. Well, the sound of that's almost a labor factor in the 1920s. Do you want to get it?